Uh, hi there. Hi there. There I am. There you are. <laughs> are you able to hear me? I am perfectly. Okay, I'm trying a new technique. You know me. <laughs> I, I, I'm always changing, always evolving. <laughs> so, I'm glad to hear that uh, that it's working well. How have you been? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. It's nice to have you here and nice to see you. And, and I think today's topic is going to be a wonderful topic for everybody. So we're going to be talking about um, potentially some new ideas and and new thoughts and, and potentially treatments uh, for women who are a little bit older and trying to improve their reproductive function. And that's what we're going to be talking about right now. Do you have some, some thoughts on, on this topic or a place that you'd like to start? Yeah, it's such a frustrating area. On the other yeah. hand, when you succeed, it feels so good because there's so much that goes into success. And the women I meet, especially most are over 40, but of course they can be any age and have low ovarian reserve. I meet them and I realize that they would be such astonishingly good mothers. And it just drives me to do everything possible to help them. And you know, the primary problem in the end is not growing a blastocyst. We grow many, many blastocysts. And, and some of them are gorgeous. They're really, really beautiful. But then when you test them genetically, they're abnormal. And I think one of the most important questions to think about is why are they abnormal? Why? What causes that? So one thing is age, but what's age? Why does age cause an increase in abnormalities in the embryos? It's really tough. Now we know that as a woman becomes older, the percentage of her eggs that are genetically abnormal increases. This is data back from the 50s and 60s. And that's a little bit over 50%, 60%. But it doesn't tell the whole story. What's going on with the other ones? Why are the rates so high? Why is it so difficult at 44, 45, 46 to get a normal embryo? And very recently, a study came out. And it was very interesting. It said it's not just that eggs are more abnormal. It's that the initial stages of embryo development are highly distorted, disarrayed. And so you start out with what's a normal egg and a normal sperm, but once they come together and once that first cell division happens, then you see many, many more abnormalities show up. And so the question is, how can we deal with that? What's causing that? And how can we deal with that? And are there some thoughts that you have or some things that you've been trying out to, uh, to try to address that and, and reverse that or change that process? I think ultimately it's primarily about energy. It's about energy. One thing that happens in all our cells is it loses energy with time. It's sure. not able to repair deficits. So we know that in uh, younger eggs, you just don't see that. You don't see... You don't see the problems with the initial uh, stage of embryonic development. And it's because they're able to heal the natural defects that happen when DNA is replicated, when it's, when it's copied, but you can't do it later. So I, I often think back to the day that, that we used to do cytoplasmic transfer. And cytoplasmic transfer is one of the things that put me on the map because I had this, someone did a show about us, and we had multiple women who were older who had succeeded. And all we did to accomplish that was to take a bit of fluid from a young woman's egg, take it out, and put it into the reproductively older woman's egg. And they were able to finally become pregnant, and it was working beautifully. And then it turns out there was only about one other place in the country that was doing this in New Jersey. And they started having problems with the babies. And once that yeah. happened, the FDA said, no, you can't do it anymore. Can't do it anymore. It's not approved. And, um, and, and so we lost one of the most important tools we had back then. So I think the key is looking at ways to increase energy in the eggs. And this is something I'm sure we'll talk about later. I'm looking at various ways of doing that. You know, I have a list of supplements that I recommend 
and I'm trying to find the perfect supplement to add to try to get these eggs the energy they need when they go through this very, very difficult process of that initial stage of embryo development. So when, when you say energy, in my mind, I go straight to mitochondrial function and ATP. Is that what you're meaning by that? Yes, you're exactly right. I didn't mention that. But when you're doing cytoplasmic transfer, what is it that you're taking out of the egg donor egg? What you're taking out is mitochondria. Right. And then you're injecting them into the reproductively older woman's eggs. And that energy really seems to help because we worked with many women that have failed repeatedly before. I think the oldest one was maybe 44, 45. And after we did the ovarian rejuvenation, they were able to become pregnant. And, and so, yeah, I think it probably is the mitochondria. We know that mitochondria become less hardy. They have less energy as yeah. a woman becomes older. So I'd be interested in what thoughts you have on the best way to, what, what kind of supplement or other strategy would you use in order to increase the energy in the eggs during this critical time? Yeah, so, you know, I know that for um, for those listening, you know, so much of what we end up focusing on and talking about when we start talking about egg quality and uh, embryo quality is focus around mitochondrial function and kind of slowing down or reversing that aging process of the cells, because that's really what we're talking about right now is is being able to do that and giving these eggs and embryos the best chance because they've had, um, you know, that, that quality, so to speak, that, that aging, that, you know, anti-aging piece has been uh, supported, right? And so um, the first thing that I think about is a little bit of time. I think about time because we need a little bit of time to impact the quality of those eggs to uh, allow that to actually happen. And so whether that's done with, with uh, ovarian rejuvenation um, or supplements or acupuncture, I think a little bit of time needs to be given. Now, all of those therapies require slightly different time frames, depending on what we're working with and so forth. But um, we're not talking about a lot of time. We're just talking about a little bit to give those therapies or treatments their opportunity to, to, to be impactful. So that's the first thing that I think about. The next thing is, you know, when... Uh, to me, acupuncture is such an amazing tool for um, helping with mitochondrial function and energy. And, and, and so that's always a piece that I like to incorporate. Something that we've been doing more recently in this population is also light therapy, um, low-level light therapy, because that has also shown uh, in some small studies to have a similar impact to it. But for me, it's adding, it's, it's not just looking at one thing, it's looking at multiple things because I want to do as much as I can to impact, to impact that, especially as we get to women who are older or their numbers aren't as ideal as we'd like to see them. I think we need multiple things. So whether it's incorporating acupuncture with ovarian reju rejuvenation and light therapy, and then the supplements that you and I have talked about in the past, you know, we want to create this nice cocktail of things to really increase that opportunity as much as we can. And so those are some of those little things that I've been doing. I mean, acupuncture has always been there for us, but the light therapy and then playing around, as you mentioned, with the, with the uh, supplements as well. Yeah, I think it's a combination of things that have to come together. Yeah. And the whole point of ovarian rejuvenation is to, in, to improve the environment within the ovary. That's what it's for. That's what it does. And things like NMN and NAD+, we do infusions, that's to improve the quality of the DNA. Once again, there's just this, this accumulation of defects that I think is very harmful. And I'm very interested in the light therapy. How do you do that? What, what results have you seen so far? Yeah, so um, the, the best way to do it, well, we do it right now in the office, although we have talked to some patients who may not, might not be able to come in as frequently as you need to for it because you need to come in or have it done two to three times a week. Um, and so if you're going to do that and you can't come in, then they have to get their own light therapy unit at home to do that in, uh, in, in enough frequency to, uh, throughout the week for it to be um, 
beneficial in any way, right? So if we're only, or if someone's watching and says, well, I can do it once a week, it's not really worth the time and effort at that point because we have not seen results with that. But if we can incorporate it multiple times a week, um, then we do see that it's been beneficial and seen a nice increase in results. I will say and preface this by saying that we don't recommend doing it after ovulation if you're actively trying. So we only do it in the follicular phase, not in the luteal phase in those circumstances. But one thing, you know, one thing that you and I talked about, I can't remember if it was one or two lives ago, you had brought up how important it was for, you know, that, that the environment is ready when you go into a, into a cycle, that going into a cycle, an IVF cycle is not necessarily going to correct and improve egg quality in and of itself in that moment, that we want to have all of that ready to go when you walk into it, essentially. And that's, that's something that I, I um, keep coming back to because I think that's such an important piece to this puzzle is laying the right foundation initially as you're going into IVF so that it can be as successful as it can be. Yeah, what's interesting to me, we normally, let's, let's talk about ovarian rejuvenation because, of course, that's one of my favorite topics. But we, <laughs> normally, we, we normally wait four weeks after doing it to begin a cycle. And we've seen some great results doing that. But other women, it's clear to me they need more than one month. They need two months, even three months in a few cases. And then you see that dramatic change. But sometimes you don't see it after only four weeks. So I think uh, one of the issues around a lot of things that we do is we don't really understand exactly how long it's going to take to see the effects that we want to see. But it can be pretty dramatic. So sometimes four weeks later, we get four eggs. We just had someone like this. And then after this, in the second month, we got something like 14 eggs. And we've seen that several times. Sometimes it just takes a little longer than you think in order to see the benefits of, of some of the therapies that, that, you and I, that you and I believe in. And uh, I think it's an important thing for us to think about. Does it, do you notice those differences in time based on the type of ovarian rejuvenation you provide? Because I know you provide several different types. You know, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we primarily do uh, two, three, and four. Okay. And I think the key element is two, because that's where we build the growth factors up. The growth factors are 10 times higher doing that as opposed to generation one. And uh, three and four both incorporate generation two. So I've not specifically looked at that. I think that's a great question. Uh, something else that we're doing now is we're looking at who responds to ovarian rejuvenation and who doesn't. And there's certain things that I can tell at the time the procedure it took a long time because some of these things are subtle. But now I have this very good idea after we do it, what the chance of success is. And I'm thinking of going, I'm thinking of going to a plan where I say A, B, or C, depending on what I see there. And I think that's part of it. And the women that you see respond very quickly within four weeks tend to be A's in the sense that when I do it, everything goes exactly as we want it to go. We're very careful about not putting too much in, and we're very careful about how we do the procedure. I think there are ways you can do the procedure that could potentially be harmful. And so we use techniques that uh, now, we use techniques that I think are very positive in terms of the effect they're going to have on the ovary. But I can see it in the ovary. As I'm doing it, I can see it. So I need to look at that too. So there's a lot of research to be done in this area. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, I find it really, really fascinating um, how how that works and the different types that you're doing because um, you're the only clinic that I know of that has those different generations. Everybody else is doing generation one and you've moved well beyond that as the name of the clinic implies, um, which I, I, I appreciate. Um, we do have a couple of questions here, some questions here. So let's see what, um, let's jump into one of them actually, which I think is actually a perfect one based on what you were just talking about. It says, how do you know which generation of ovarian rejuvenation is right for you? It's a great question. Well, we know that generation one does not work well for age-related infertility. 
and some people have reported very good results with uh, Generation One. But when you look at who they're taking care of, these are much younger women. I think women that would have been fairly straightforward to help anyway. Generation Two is the key to me, and the vast majority of our pregnancies came from Generation Two or Generation Three. We're going to publish a comparison soon. Uh, oh, good. Probably in January, or February, twenty twenty-three a comparison of those two, but they're similar. The main difference between them is that generation two lasts three months, whereas generation three lasts six to seven months. It lasts longer. And that's a great benefit depending on your specific circumstance. So what we do with patients is we go through the benefits and uh, the potential downfalls of each, and then they decide. Uh, generation four is our latest generation. I'm very excited about this, but again, we have really no real data yet. And what we do there is we add additional elements. We add growth hormone, we add FSH, we add glutathione, we add NAD plus, you know, we add a variety of different things uh, to the cocktail. So it's generation three with extras that have some good reason to think they may be helpful. We're gathering data and we'll report that soon as well. That's great. Um for everyone who's just joining now, if you have questions, the best place for us to see them is going to be in that little circle with the question mark in the bottom right hand corner. So if you add your question there, that's going to be the best way for me to find them. Um, we had another question here. Um, it says, what about ovarian reju rejuvenation for a 48 year old woman? And I know um, a couple of times ago when we were talking, you had mentioned the oldest um, age of a woman that you guys were successful with, um, but I can't recall how old that was. Well, 47 is the oldest to have a live birth. We work with women, in fact, this morning, was a woman who's 51. But for them, I don't feel like it's fair to, to say it's for reproduction. So instead, in those circumstances, uh, we call it an attempt to improve menopausal symptoms. Now, does that mean that some of these women are not interested in fertility? No, not at all. In fact, I know this woman is, but I just don't feel right about calling it uh, for reproduction when it's considerably older than any woman's ever been to succeed with, uh, with any kind of assisted reproductive te technology, IVF or anything like that. What's interesting about it is it works extremely well for women over the age of 48, it works really, really well because what it does, and we showed this in one of the papers, is it actually increases hormone levels. So we go into the center of the ovary, which is where the, where the factories that create the hormones are, and that's where we do the injection. And we see very, very nice jumps. We, we have women that are having very severe hot flashes. And after we do it for several months, it resolves and they come back six months to 12 months later and then uh, do it again. They don't want to take external hormones. And it's a way of, of improving the situation using their ovaries, using an improvement in the function of the ovaries. We haven't had anyone succeed in terms of fertility above the age of 47. That's tough. It's really tough. Yeah, that's hard. But, but we have seen women who began to create follicles. And whenever you see a follicle, you've got a chance. And, and I hope that someone does succeed up in that age range, nothing would make me happier. That's great. Someone was asking if we're recording this. This is naturally recorded, and when it's done, we're going to post it um, so that it's saved and you can go back and reference it. Um, we have another question. It says, I've already had one uh, ovarian rejuvenation done. How many are recommended or okay for someone who's 41? She's 41. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And we have something of an answer because we have a Chinese patient. I think she was 44 years old when she came in and she said, I want to do 12. And so, <laughs> okay. and so over a period of a couple of years, she'd come in every other month and she'd do another ovarian rejuvenation. Her AMH level was initially undetectable and it, it went up to 1.3 and she just had a baby using a surrogate and she has another one on the way. So she's the only one who's really done a substantial number, but we have had several do two or three, and we have seen an improvement in results in some of them, 
uh, with the with the second ovarian rejuvenation. So in general, we don't recommend it. I think we see benefits the first time, but there are some women that seem to show major benefits with a second or third, but we're still working out the details with that. If you've done one and it hasn't worked, I would absolutely think you should consider trying again as long as enough time has passed that we're able to really judge the effectiveness of the first ovarian rejuvenation. That's what I was just about to ask you. So how much time do you think is okay or what's the minimum amount of time before doing that next one that you would recommend? Well, you remember I mentioned that, uh, for example, generation two seems to work for around three months. Right. And that's exactly what we've seen, three to four months. And so okay. the AMH level will rise. They'll make more follicles, more eggs. And then once they hit three to four months, then you see it go back down to baseline. So that's what I'm basing that on. And I think once it goes down to baseline, if you still haven't been able to create a genetically normal embryo, then I think it's worth considering. But we should talk about it. You know, we, we should really discuss what's happened so far and what your options are. That's great. Someone did ask a question, not specifically around this, but talking about fallopian tubes. And she says, you know, is it possible to conceive with one fallopian tube? I'm assuming that um, you mean, is it possible to conceive naturally with one fallopian tube? And the short answer to that is yes, it is possible. It can be more, ch more difficult or challenging, but it is possible. Yeah, oh. absolutely. I've, I've seen many cases like that. I yeah. think the fallopian tubes are really not considered as much as they should be. So we see patients that have failed multiple times before with IVF. And I realized that they never had their tubes tested. And it's crazy because some of those women, they have dilated tubes. It's full of that inflammatory material yeah. that leaks back in and dramatically reduces implantation. Or sometimes they've had uh, the, the required test years ago and never repeated it. So before you do a transfer, especially if it's a highly valued embryo, one you worked for years to get, you want to make sure everything is perfect before you do it, before you do the the transfer. Uh, absolutely, 100%. You know, so I've seen this question a couple of times and, and I'm, what I'm gonna recommend, I'm gonna say the question, but my recommendation is gonna be to, to call Gen 5. Someone wants to know if there's different price points for the different types of ovarian rejuvenation. There certainly is, and my recommendation is that you contact Gen 5 Fertility. If you've got questions about that to set up a consultation, they can help answer all of those questions. Um, that's probably gonna be easiest and the best way to do that. Um, another question is, does producing a good number of follicles after ovarian rejuvenation indicate good IVF um, results or candidacy? Yeah, it doesn't always work, but I think that's yeah. one of the most important things you can see because what it shows you is that the ovarian rejuvenation worked. And so its purpose is not really to get more eggs per se, it's to get better eggs. But when you see that you've gotten more eggs, then there's a greater chance that you've also gotten, you've created an environment that will let a normal egg grow. And uh, so I think it's a very good sign. And the majority of women who show that sign are able to succeed. Yeah. I mean, we always have to feel like if we respond to that and we can produce more, and our ovaries can function better, produce more eggs, that you have a better opportunity to be successful in that process. And I think that's wonderful to see. You know, Dr. Wood and I work with a lot of couples uh, jointly in situations like this. And it's really the thing that I always see to be the most impactful is when we're able to, um, you know, uh, stack those different therapies, those, diff those different ther uh, therapies and treatments, one on top of the other. So that way we're taking as comprehensive of an approach as possible. And that's why we've been talking about these different sort of techniques where you've got ovarian rejuvenation and that's handling one side of things, but we still have to, you know, address the other part of the body. You know, what else is going on inside with all the other cells? So we do want to add on those other things like the supplements we were talking about, making sure that your diet is on point, because if you're eating terribly and then you're just relying on ovarian rejuvenation or the supplements you're taking to kind of, you know, do their work, it, it, you're creating an uphill battle and, and oftentimes, you know, it's one step forward, two steps back. And so we want to create the best environment possible, which means having 
a good comprehensive lifestyle, good quality sleep, that we're taking care of ourselves, we're managing our stress, and then we were getting all those other nutrients in, those therapies have, as, have the best opportunity to be effective and do what they need to do. So think about those things. We're always looking for that like magic pill or that silver bullet. We want to look at everything uh, together. I, I think what you've said is so important. I think the combining what you do and what I do, that seems to be ideal to me. And you're right. Too many people think just doing ovarian rejuvenation, bam, I'm going to be pregnant. Occasionally it happens. But those people in general are doing the other things that they should do. So I love it when someone works with you while they're working with me. And I think the combination is really fantastic. And we've had many successes together and hope we have we many have. more in the future. Yeah, we do. That's right. Someone asked specifically about acupuncture. She said, um, what does acupuncture treatment look like and how many would you recommend? So I'm not quite sure what you mean by what it looks like. Um, but in terms of um, you know, frequency and uh, number of visits, a lot of that really just depends on when you start and in relationship to assuming you're doing IVF in relationship to your IVF, when that's going to be the timing of it. So we do try to get in about 12 visits uh, prior to or leading up to the IVF cycle or transfer. Um, well, actually retrieval first and transfer is a, sep a separate situation. And so if we have enough time, then that can be spread out um, once a week and if that time condenses then we're doing two or three times a week it all just depends on um on when we get started and when when everything's scheduled and, and that's really an important piece to it that's what the data shows specifically and so that's how we base the research shows that's how we base our uh, recommendations so i hopefully that answers your question i think it should um but if it doesn't you can you can ask again um Let's see. We have another question here. Someone was asking um, about, you know, us doing some sort of uh, live in the future about low AMH and diminished mm -hmm. ovarian reserve, um, but specifically for women who are younger, who are in their, you know, early to mid thirties, which I think would be an interesting conversation. So we could mm -hmm. see about doing that at some point in the future for for everyone as well. That's a great idea. Yeah, I like it. Um, as we are round, uh, you know, wrapping this up for, for everybody here listening, um, actually, I'm reading this other question, so I'm going to ask it because I think you have the answer for it. It says, when is Gen 5 going to be publishing the research papers around this? <laughs> you know, I saw that question, and I'm glad you brought it up. You know, we, many of our research papers are online. I think there are two of them that I haven't posted yet. But if you go to the website, you have the far right-hand side. I think it's called research. It might call, be called other or something like that. But we actually place the research papers right there on the website so that, you can, so that you can click on them and download them and read them. And some people actually do read them. Um, and as I mentioned, <laughs> I think I have one or two more. We just got one accepted in the last week regarding ovarian rejuvenation and we have several more planned it's it's a little tough because i'm pretty busy doing clinical work but i know how important it is to to, to put these papers out there so that other physicians can see things they may want to consider and that people from all over the world can see what's being done in terms of ovarian rejuvenation because far too often now they go in and they're told you need to use an egg donor this week, I know we got to close, but this week, someone came in 34 years old and they went to a big fertility center here in San Diego and they had a bad cycle and they were told, you need to use an egg donor. And they said, you know, I've done one cycle. I don't want to use an egg donor. Thanks. And they said, then you need to go somewhere. You need to go somewhere that deals with situations like yours. And that's very sad to me as, 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 as a, medical workers we should be taking care of people not telling them you have no chance you need to go somewhere else it's absolutely crazy but um i got off topic there but the point no. is yes 
Yes, I do have many papers there on the website, and I'll put more soon. You know what I appreciated about uh, uh, about that last statement that you just said about that. You know, I don't appreciate that the clinic was ru you know rush the patient to say go do donor, but what I do appreciate them saying is is you know basically saying well we could only offer you donor if you want something else go you're you're going to need to go someplace else for that because at least they're acknowledging that this is where their limit is at. And they're saying that you need to find support someplace else. So it would be nice if they could support them, but if they can't, at least they're suggesting, you know, that you need to go someplace else for it. But because all too often I just hear the donor piece and that's the only option that they're given is donor, 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 where there's a lot of other options that, you know, we both know about that could be incorporated to, to, uh, to potentially see the results that they want. So, um, but you know, I think someone was asking, so what's the, you know, what's the, the new information that we're trying to share for women who are over 40? And if you're just joining, it's, it's a multifaceted approach is the first thing that I want you all to take away from this is that, you know, using different therapies in conjunction with each other that are geared towards, um, you know, restoring or reversing egg quality, um, ovarian rejuvenation, anti-aging, reproductive anti-aging, whatever we want to call it, um, and restoring the, the health of the mitochondrial function is what we want to do. And the therapies that Dr. Wood and I discussed today were ovarian rejuvenation and acupuncture. You might not always think of acupuncture to do that specific piece, but it can be incorporated for that. We discussed some supplements. We also t discussed uh, low light level therapy, which is what I'm incorporating at the office as well with the acupuncture. And, and those are just some of the techniques that we think could be beneficial for all of you. Any last words, Dr. Wood? You know, I think that each one of those plays a role. Mm -hmm. And maybe one of them increases the chance of success by 5% and another 10%. But when you add them up, it becomes very substantial. And so I think it's, you mentioned this before, I don't think it's wise to focus too much on just one of those therapies, but try to put it all together and get the best of each thing that's available in this difficult area, but an area that you and I focus on. And um, I think if we do that, we can continuously do better. You have ideas, you're doing new things, I'm doing new things. We're not giving up on this. We, we want things to be much better. When someone comes in, we want to be able to tell them, here's some things you can do that should definitely improve your chance of success. They deserve that. 100%. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for your time and joining today and, and imparting your knowledge. I really appreciate it, as always, for all the wonderful questions. We had a ton of great questions and a ton of questions that we just couldn't get to, so I apologize for that. But I want to thank you all for joining today. Um, we're going to post this video in just a little bit live, uh, the replay for everybody to watch. And if you have more questions, go ahead and post them and we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood, for being here. You have a wonderful evening. Everybody else have a wonderful night and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.